Health Department of Anthropology. He's been a guest speaker at Stanford University. Um, and is currently, which I'm most proud of, an active volunteer here at the Museum of Indigenous People. Uh, Josh has been kicking some serious tail over here. We appreciate everything and his family has done for us. Uh, Josh has also been featured in magazines and books such as the Prehistoric Times and Cruising the Fossil Coastline. That sounds very <laughs> California. <Yes. laughs> uh, where he actually uh, formally earned his moniker Mad Max meets Jurassic Park. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Dude. That's cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, in official literature, they yeah, actually, yeah, wow, wow, that's, that's like that's like being knighted. Uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, without further ado, I uh, introduce to you uh, Josh Balsek. Hello, everyone. How's everybody doing today? Good. 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 Got to hear this is not my, this is my favorite. the volume real fast. So uh, thank you to Manuel for the wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm here today about talking about my experiences being indigenous, also known as Native American, in the fields of archaeology and also paleontology. So uh, Manny went through my uh, resume, but just to kind of oversee it real fast, um, and also explain why I'm even up here talking to you. I am actually active, and um, I was a volunteer at the Tar Pits. Um, I did a mammoth dig on site as a scientific illustrator. I was a guest speaker on the mammoth we found at Stanford U, and I was exhibitor at the Natural History Museum in LA, exhibitor at the Cooper Center, and currently a volunteer at the Museum of Indigenous People, also known as MIP. <laughs> Very proud of that. So what we're going to go over first is just kind of a rough breakdown of my experiences so you can see what I'm capable of doing being from Native descent. Um, so one of the first things we talk about are my archaeological beginnings. Uh, so this is mainly in southern Arizona conservation, and also we were meeting with what was known as the Hiatse Otam District, which is a potential nation state within the larger Tohono Otam. Um, so this is known as Site AZ-1. Uh, this is one of the first sites that I ever got to work on. Um, this site is a huge mass burial ground, and we were there doing conservation on this site as early as, I think, 2005, 2006. Um, as you can see from this site, uh, part of the things that we were doing at this site were we were actually markering the grave. So as you can see here, uh, we used crosses for two reasons. One of the reasons was they were free, uh, so they were donated from one of the local burial and grave sites. The second reason was not a lot of people know about Native American burial sites. In fact, so many people don't know about Native American burial sites that when we first visited this site, we just saw a lot of these rock uh, just piles. And what happens in southern Arizona is you get something known as off-roading culture or ATV culture. So if you're riding a four-wheel drive ATV vehicle and you see a pile of rocks, you have one instinct that jumps into your brain, and that's to jump over the rocks. However, these people did not know that they were actually jumping over and damaging graves. So what we had to do was kind of balance, like, yes, we want to be uh, sensitive to the religious aspects of the people that were buried there, but we also wanted to use a symbol that was the most recognizable symbol in Western society, the cross. Because if you see a pile of rocks and you see a cross, your brain is gonna say, okay, that's a grave. Maybe I should think twice about jumping over this and possibly taking a ghost home with me that day. <laughs> Along with this, we also found a lot of surrounding artifacts, which also cemented the fact that what we found was indeed indigenous in nature. So part of this was actually ruins. Uh, so these are Pueblo wall structures and as you can see, the status right there is very notable. We will get back to that status. Uh, but this was the first real indicator that we were onto something native in origin. Uh, other things we found on the site was a geoglyph. So people who don't know, geoglyphs are kind of like petroglyphs, but they're on a larger scale. Uh, so the best thing you can use for geoglyph that's popular is like the Nazca lines in South America. Those are known as geoglyphs, which can be miles in length. We have them here in the Southwest. Uh, this geoglyph is of a serpent. 
So you can see the head right there, and it kind of snakes around. And there's a story behind the serpent, and I'll be sure to get back to you on that later. Uh, but this is another thing that we found. Along with that, we found petroglyphs. Uh, so these petroglyphs were found no more than like a couple of feet away from the primary burial site. So by just correlating all the evidence that we found, we were able to kind of conclusively say, even before we had our archaeologists on site, to say, like, yes, this is definitely a native burial. So these are some of the academics that we were able to work with, and we'll get into detail. Uh, but this site actually introduced me into the academic community. So through the academic community, I was able to start getting more and more involved with things like writing papers, doing mainly scientific illustrations and also lectures, and also doing more volunteer work with all the various museums that I was a part of. Paleontology begins. This was a little bit more fun. Uh, so as well as archaeology, I also did paleontology. And paleontology, as you can see, these are all photos. These are all my photos, I should say. Uh, so this is from the tar pits. This is me wrestling a T-Rex skull. It's a fossil cat. Do not ever attempt to wrestle a T-Rex skull. It is not going to go well. <laughs> um, and this is a Bronto Theater, which is also in, uh, indigenous to North America. Uh, so one of the first really big sites that I got to work on in the field of paleontology was in Northern California, and that was known as the Castroville Mammoth, home of the artichoke. I learned that while digging up the mammoth. <laughs> in fact, this mammoth was actually found on an artichoke farm. So a lot of stuff that we learned in Northern California that was not pertaining to the mammoth, but this mammoth dig was one of the first experiences that I had as a field digger, and this was with the La Brea Tar Pits team. Uh, this mammoth site was very notable. It was a Colombian mammoth, uh, so this drawing is actually the actual scientific illustration I did for that dig. This illustration is also on exhibit at Foothill in the anthropology department. Uh, so this was actually one of my first, first, first official scientific illustrations. Um, and I should note for people who are savvy about our megafauna here, the Colombian mammoth is the native species that we have in North America, not to be confused with the woolly mammoth. We do technically get woolly mammoth in the Americas, but they're up in Alaska and Canada, whereas the larger, taller Colombian mammoth is indigenous to here in North America. And these mammoth species are the species that what's known as the Clovis people, which are some of the first recognized indigenous people here in North America, that's what they were eating all the time. <laughs> so another thing about this site is one of the most significant things we found was a piece of hair. And this is actually only one strand of what was huge clumps of fur for the Colombian mammoth. The reason why this is significant was when we found this, give or take around 2011, it was one of the first times we had recognized Colombian mammoth fur ever discovered, not just in North America, ever discovered. And the way we knew this was Colombian mammoth was we actually were able to do DNA sequencing. So that actually verified this as Colombian mammoth hair. Huge, huge leap. We will not be able to clone a mammoth from this hair. I know. <laughs> uh -oh. I know. It's not a good idea anyways, but we can't. Um, so from there, we actually did a lecture at Stanford, and this is actually one of my illustrations with uh, Dr. Timothy King, who's another prominent archaeologist up in Northern California. And that's me as a guest speaker, so, you know, just so you know, all the facts that Manuel read were true, <laughs> <laughs> including the book that actually has me described as Mad Max meets Jurassic Park. I did not influence that author, that's just what he wrote. <laughs> So, along with doing other scientific illustrations, there's also stuff that I've done for magazine and publications, more commonly known in the public as paleo art. But it also includes things like scientific illustrations. This is one of the illustrations that we have right here. Um, this is another illustration that we did. This was under the supervision of uh, Dr. Thomas Carr. So Dr. Thomas Carr is one of the most prominent, if not the foremost prominent, um, it's just, um, prominent guys in uh, the field of Tyrannosaurus rex. So this is actually a Tyrannosaurus rex, also indigenous to North America. Okay, this is another piece of that skull that I said that was of the Brontotheres. These are Brontotheres. This is a species known as Megaceros. 
Uh, this was a piece that I did for a magazine publication that was the prehistoric times. And this illustration is actually the illustration that you saw in the lecture with Dr. Timothy King. So this is known as a ghost image, where you go from the skeletal to a ghost image and finally to a fully reconstructed image of the Columbia Mammoth, specifically the Columbia Mammoth that we dug up in Northern California. And this is a more uh, finer ghost image, which is a Tyrannosaurus rex. This is the specimen known as Harley, which is the original skull is at site at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. And fun fact, this skull is the same skull that's used in the movie Jurassic Park. Uh, so when you see the scene on the rotunda and you see the two dinosaur skeletons, that skull is Harley's skull. And along with doing 2D and digital art, I actually do practical art in the field of paleontology as well. So I'm going to bring something out. This is a saber cat, also commonly known as the saber-toothed tiger, not related to the tiger. Uh, but saber cats, this is a piece that I actually was able to do a lot of restoration work. So what we do is we do things like re-drilling in the teeth, the teeth were washed out, uh, doing all kinds of weathering techniques on this. A lot of these techniques I actually learned from Hollywood, funny enough, because I have a background in special and visual effects working in movies. Yes, you can look me up on IMDb. <laughs> <laughs> so is this a really specific uh, this is a fossil cast, uh, so this is not a real skull. I would not be handling a real skull like this so nonchalantly. Uh, but um, thank you for your question, by the way. But we do want to make sure we save questions for after the talk. Um, so along with these practical effects and using these practical effects for making real skulls or things that look like real skulls, because obviously you were fooled, so that means I did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> so along with doing this, um, we're gonna get into additional exhibits. Uh, so, as I said, I worked in movies and visual effects for a few years, and that gave me access to other movies and movie props. So what we did is we started doing what's known as gateway science. Basically, people that are in the community that watch the movie Jurassic Park, and after you watch the movie Jurassic Park, you suddenly know everything there is about paleontology. That is not true. Uh, same thing for the movie Indiana Jones. You think you watch Indiana Jones and you know everything about archaeology. Not true. But we use those movies to introduce people into the fields of science. So this is from the Cooper Center. These are from the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. Uh, so as you can see, we did an event called Dino Fest. That's, the bit. That's actually Harley's skull right there. <laughs> That's mounted. Uh, and we had cute little baby dinos that we would use to introduce kids to dinosaurs. Uh, and this is from our exhibits. So our exhibits were wildly popular uh, pre-COVID. Uh, so when we had in-person events, we would just put all of our props in our archives uh, through an organization that I actually founded with a lot of my other team members here, uh, known as Jurassicon, now known as JPX. Uh, as you can see, that's a Velociraptor, Triceratops, Baby Raptor, Compi, you can name them all day. Um, and including the most famous archeological movie of all time, Indiana Jones. So this exhibit was very special because Timothy King, who is the archaeologist that you saw at the Stanford lecture, actually was the gallery interpreter for this exhibit. He even brought his own artifacts from his own collection. Uh, so we actually had a mix of both movie props and actual archaeological props. And another treat I have for you guys. I actually have the idol right here. <laughs> So this is known as a, a slop cast. So this is an idol that we use for guests to kind of take pictures with, they can handle. We have a better casting of this that we save for an exhibit, uh, but this one is also uh, slop casted off of the stunt idol that was used at Paramount Studios. And yes, I have visited Paramount Studios itself. So I'm gonna leave that there too. So, and with all this uh, sums up my resume, uh, so this is everything that I've done in the field. <laughs> so now you know why I'm here talking. Um, so what we're gonna get into now is the importance of native representation in science. Uh, so basically, it's one thing to talk about my experience and my critique and my resume. It's another thing to talk about the importance of native representation or indigenous representation in the fields of science. So we're gonna go into each of these categories the first one we're going to talk about is who are the natives or prominent Native Americans in the, in the fields of science. One of the first ones we have is known as Bertha Parker Cody. 
and she is credited with being the first female native archaeologist, so not just native archaeologist, first female native archaeologist. And she is recognized in Western academia, born in 1907, uh, died in 1978. Uh, but she did not know at the time, but she was blazing a trail for people to pretty much study their own history. Um, sadly, natives, because you get, we get a lot of stigmas as far as like, you know, you hear stories about like, well, don't Native Americans go to college for free? Don't they get free education, blah, blah, blah. Yes and no, um, and even people who do benefit from these laws, which are pretty much blanketed to kind of make up for a lot of the wrongdoings that have happened in our history, uh, they still face stigma and stereotypes. So this is an article by Beacon Article, which is from the University of Portland, and it notes that a lot of the Native students that were attending that college still fell under stereotypes, like just as recently as I believe this article is from, oh yeah, this year, March 7th, 2022, like we're still fighting stereotypes to this day. Uh, the article continues to go on about basically more in deep and depth about the misrepresentation. So it quotes the Smithsonian Magazine where it says, and I quote, however, the lack of representation of Native Americans isn't limited to popular media, but can also be seen in education systems. According to the Smithsonian Magazine, most students across the United States don't get comprehensive, thoughtful, or even accurate education in Native history and culture. A 2015 study by researchers at Pennsylvania State University found that 87% of content taught about Natives includes only pre-1900s content. 87% of students in the United States have outdated lessons about Native history. Think about that for a moment. And actually make a note about this date right here, uh, 1900, that's gonna come back later, so just make a mental note of that. The article also is, uh, so it's not just kind of like university articles, we actually have papers, scientific papers. So this is a paper from Cambridge University Nelson et al. 2018. For those people that don't know scientific papers, basically it goes by the primary author, who is Nelson et al., who are the co-authors, and the date of the publication, which is 2018. So this is a very recent publication, just one year shy of the global pandemic. So this publication actually goes into further Native American statistics. So not only as far as why we're so underrepresented, but also why we're actually the smallest demographic in the entire United States. The paper goes on to say, and I quote, uh, Native Americans generally have the lowest representation compared to all other races throughout all the national demographic uh, society or survey. Uh, representation of Native American students and faculty in academia, mind you, in the top 50 departments in the 15 disciplines of science among students, Native American representation rarely matches the overall U.S. population, about 1.2%. So we, as people, only represent 1.2% of our global demographic in the sciences and in the academic disciplines. And this isn't just students, too. This is also faculty. So instructors, educators, scientists, we only represent about 1.7%. Along with this, we actually get into um, one more statistic, which is actually very hurtful, because it's one thing to say, okay, we can correlate the low, the low representation of natives with our low demographic. Like, if a population only represents a certain percentage of the US population, you would think, yes, it would make sense that they only have a low percentage within academia. However, the paper continues to say that within this study, there is a general downward trend in all fields, meaning that it isn't that we're just a low demographic, the trend is actually getting lower and lower and lower. And it isn't for a lack of interest in the fields of science. The paper goes on to say, this indicates that in general, Native Americans are not being retained once they enter academia. So that means a student can show an interest in archeology, span get a degree, go into a great college, get the diploma, that does not even guarantee that they're gonna be retained in the field. So that means that 
And I know, because I'm a student, and I have just finished my student loans just last year. <laughs> and I will say that I've seen many students with student loans earn their degree and just were never able to break into the fields that they would study into. So it is a common thing. Now, I will say that before we go forward that the following images might be a little disturbing, uh, so just fair warning. I don't see any young kids in the audience, so everybody should be fine. Uh, we're gonna talk about a harmful path. So another question that I get asked is, okay, well, let's say everything else is great and natives get good representation. Why aren't native populations or indigenous people more trusting with academia? Surely in the years 2022, we've outgrown all this stuff, right? Well, there's a stigma that Native Americans and indigenous populations have with academia, and it's a very, like it's a very, the words are hard to say because I'm just picturing the images that I have to show, but it's a very understanding se uh, series of mistrust. Basically, like there's a reason why these populations and these Native nations do not trust academia, and it's sadly the history of academia it was not kind to Native nations and indigenous populations within the United States. Uh, so right here we have grave robbing, uh, which is what I like to call faux academia. So faux academia falls into a category which is known as like roadside attractions, uh, little side stores in the shops, people that would just open a museum in their backyard or in their house, and they were not a museum, but because nobody was there kind of mitigating what they were doing, they were just kind of amassing graves, digging up graves, and just putting it all out there. One of the most infamous people doing this was a person known as Ralph Glidden. So it's this guy right here. Uh, born in Long Island, came to California, resided in Catalina Island, which is off the coast of Santa Barbara. Uh, Ralph is credited with single-handedly destroying the history of the Tongva Nation in Catalina Island by grave robbing countless burial sites for roadside museums and even selling human remains to tourists. This is an image of his museum. As you can see, the banisters are decorated with the human sacrament, that's the hip bone. The chandeliers are constructed of human shoulder blades. Along the corners here are human skulls. These pearl-like structures are human teeth. These cases right here are probably things that were both exhibited for the museum and also sold off to tourists. In fact, there's a photo I did not include that showed Ralph with two uh, people from the, give or take the 1920s, just holding human skulls. It's unknown if they purchased the skulls and then just went back to their house. But this entire room is the entire history of the Tongva native nation that was just dug up. The next part is not so much faux academia, but something that comes into faux academia and proper academia. So this person is called Helen Healy. Uh, this picture is actually, and this entire article was known from an archaeological journal known as Kiva. And the Kiva journal, which if you can find the back issue, still has these images. Helen Healy was an archaeologist assigned to excavate the burial ground in Gila Pueblo. Uh, she is shown here posing with the zoomed native remains, and she altered and posed herself as the temporary museum set up in a cottage on the dig site. So basically what Helen did is she set up a faux museum in her cabin, and because she was the only person doing the excavation, the academia at the time around the area of Gila Pueblo did not really do anything to dissuade Helen. They just kind of said, okay, keep doing what you're doing because at the very least you're digging up the artifacts and we can figure it out later. What they didn't know Helen was doing was she was actually digging up human remains. She would set them up on coat hangers and dress them up in her living room as a museum. Along with the skulls, there are little marbles that she applied into the skulls for eyes. She also put little clay applications for noses. This is a very morbid picture, and honestly, when I first stumbled upon it, it sent a shiver up my spine. Um, but this was actually technically approved academia for Hilo Pueblo, what would later become Hilo Pueblo Museum. Not only this, Helen also covered 
a couple of skulls with uh, other provisions. And then she also even got local artifacts like pottery. The most infamous thing she did was she got two pieces of pottery. She crocheted a net over one and then lacquered it so it could look like a piece of pottery she saw in another museum. So that artifact was completely destroyed. And she got a piece of polychrome pottery, which she then painted gold for whatever reason, artifact destroyed. The harmful past sadly does not stop there. Uh, we have additional grave robbing. The most infamous of these is known as the burial mounds in St. Louis. St. Louis burial mounds were numbered in the hundreds. And what ended up happening through state approved infrastructure plans to build roads, housing, and academia approved excavation sites, all the burial mounds were, were just diminished to these single pillars, if not completely obliterated. This pillar represents what was a burial mound with which would extend hundreds of feet on either side. Human remains were in those mounds. Human remains were either bulldozed or exhumed. And of the hundreds of burial mounds in the city of St. Louis, only one remains today. More academia proved brave, broadening if not grave exhumation. So these actually is one of the largest, if not the largest, exhumed grave sites known as Dickinson's Mount. So Dickinson's Mount actually did, these methods are destructive, don't get me wrong, what I'm about to say is not praising Dickinson's Mount, but at the very least they left the skulls and the bodies in situ. The term in situ means when you find something in the ground, you leave it in the ground because what's known as geological data can be lost if you pick something out of the ground and we lose almost all the knowledge that would make that artifact valuable. So if you find a piece of pottery and a piece of ground, it's worth more if you let the archeologist get the data in the ground versus if you pick it up and you put it on your shelf, it's now just another piece of pottery because we lost all kinds of geological data. So not to give them too much credit, but at the very least, they left the graves in the ground in situ. Uh, but this does not mean that the methods that they used to excavate and exhume all these graves did not destroy countless amounts of geological data, artifacts, countless pieces of history that we have no way of getting back. Sadly, state-approved academia did not always do this. Now, this is an artifact known as the Antler King. This is at the Field Museum, Artifact 56080. This photo is what's known as a copper headpiece that was found in Hopewell Mound. It's a very rare piece, and this picture actually gives us more data than what the museum ended up doing with this artifact. Because as you can see, it was attached to human remains or human teeth. There is a drawing that you, if you can find a book from dating in the 1920s and 1930s, you might actually luck out and find that kind of engraving. However, the Field Museum, now mind you, this is the big Field Museum in Chicago, like the Field Museum, did this. They completely exhumed the artifact. We don't know what happened to the remains. We don't know what happened to the grave site. They just plucked out the copper headpiece, let the rest kind of sit aside or weather away or just dug it up and they put it on this kind of like very simplistic totem. Um, doesn't even look like an indigenous person, but they claim it represents a effigy of some kind. However, if you compare this to the previous slide, there's just so much more data that's there that was completely destroyed versus these very simplistic means. And this was ended up being excavated, I think, between the 1920s and 1930s. So, one last piece before we jump ahead out of this. There's one last thing I have to address, and that's the concept of bone rooms. So bone rooms are rooms full of human remains that are active in most large archeological and just general giant museums. However, this does not make the practice good. Um, this is actually from the Smithsonian. This is their bone room. This is pre-1990. And the Smithsonian, actually retained the Native American remains all the way up to 1990. These remains were found by any means necessary, meaning that they were probably genuine excavations, they were probably graves that were robbed, they were probably people that were killed in the American Indian Wars, they were probably remains that they found on the side of the road. The museum did not question, and continues to go over that the AAA, uh, not to be 
confused with AAA, uh, recognized the history founded on racism in regards of indigenous people, noting in 1901 its academic views were founded on eugenics. For people who don't know what eugenics are, they are a pseudoscience that listed basically if you weren't European or from the Western world, but you were a human being, you were not a human being, you were a subspecies of human. That was eugenics. And this was actually set forth by one of the founders, if not the president, of the Anthropology Association from 1901. Now remember when I said that date, 1901, basically, oh, wrong slide. Okay, I thought I had another slide there. <laughs> so basically it says that this person, uh, who was the president of the Anthropology Association, if not the founding president, said, it was clear that the savage stands strikingly close to subhuman species in every aspect. That's an actual academic notation from 1901. Now remember when I told you the University of Ohio, I believe, noted that people were being taught Native history as late as 1900s. That means, in theory, your child, if they had Native American descent, could go to a public school, be handed a handbook, and be told you're subhuman and you're functionally extinct because you're Native American. That's the type of history that we're dealing with here. So to summarize, it's understandable that we have trust issues <laughs> as far as like, you know, academia and why not a lot of Native nations and indigenous people want to work with academia. We are barely getting apologies from 2022, this year. Are they barely apologizing for hundreds of years of abuse and harm? So this also counts as to why it's important for natives to be a part of academia now, because now we have a chance to actually come forth and dictate our own history, write about our own history, and not have people that were pretty much, not to use too harsh of a phrase, but racist, tell us what our history is. We can now finally study our own history. Now, a part of that is our heritage, and for anybody that's in the audience that is of uh, indigenous or native descent, the thing that got me into this field was that it was actually my heritage. I didn't really have an interest in archaeology. I did have some interest in paleontology, but it wasn't until I started studying my actual heritage that I started learning, like, oh, this is part of who I am. Like, these stories, these artifacts, this museum that we're standing in, this is all part of who we are as a people. Now, here we have a picture of my father. Mm -hmm. uh, who is Ishmael Walse, we'll get to him later, but this is actually the beginning of my road into archaeology. He actually did research through genealogy. We actually followed our family tree to these um, records that were housed in Yuma, in the Yuma Library, and from there we were actually led to what I thought was not just a native burial site, but actually my family burial site. <laughs> so I actually have the rare opportunity to have done conservation work to save a burial site where my ancestors are and my relatives. That's the kind of heritage that we as people are now barely being able to break through and be a part of. This site, just to get further into it, because it's my family plot, if you will, uh, it is a site that was against a wash. That's a tiny van for size comparison. That's a, that's a person. And all of these little mounds here are graves. They actually go further up this direction, all the way down to where that person is. Countless graves. I think we counted at least 60 graves. And for those of you horror movie fans, yes, at this native burial site, there was a pet cemetery that was located right there. I actually have a rubbing of a gravestone dedicated to one hooch. Bottom rest in peace, huge. The family site, as I said, when we did a bunch of um, conservation, we cleaned up brush, we made the graves more visible so that way people wouldn't accidentally go over them with their ATVs. This was my privilege to do as part of my heritage. Um, and this is something that I think is an opportunity that is available now to more indigenous people to become not only a part of academia, but also take care of your own heritage and history through conservation. Now, along with this site, and again, just to go over really quick more of the things we found at this site, we also found a burial basket that was actually uh, shown to us by a local archaeologist. 
that is left in C2. Because it's in C2 and not touched, we are not, disclo we are not disclosing the location of everything you're going to be seeing here. Um, the petroglyphs that we looked at earlier are also at this site. This is something that's new that not too many people have seen. So a few miles into the hills where this burial site was found, we also found this. It's a very large geoglyph structure. I am hesitant to say what it is because the verdict is still out. Every academic we took out there kind of just scratched their head and said, we don't know. So not only am I conserving history as far as my family history and my heritage, we actually have the opportunity to conserve history through record stuff that people don't even know to this day. Because you have to remember, with the hundreds of years of academia that we have in our hands and papers that were written, it's still estimated that a good 70% of Native American history, cultural history, pre-Columbus, is lost. So this is something that we probably rediscovered, and it's still yet to be decided what it is. Now, as we said before, the heartbreaking part of this is, again, the status of these ruins is destroyed. Um, once we visited these ruins, this was back in 2007, I believe, we took photographic record of these ruins because, sadly, they were on private land, and we did not know what was going to happen to these ruins once we left. What happened was they were destroyed. We visited the site no more than a few years later, give or take three to four years, and the entire pillars were actually bulldozed to the ground because of the private ownership changed hands. And whether malicious or not, I think what happened was they just didn't know what they were, they needed more land to put something on, and they just bulldozed them. And we didn't find out until after the fact. So going into the destruction of this site, basically what we have here is historical documentation of site AC1. So this was a mining town, and this is the town that was basically booming at the time. Uh, this is colonial times. And I'm going to show you all these pictures, and I'm going to have sadly another heartbreak story for you guys. Uh, so this was the mining town, the local store. Um, again, a lot of eateries. These probably date back to the 1800s when Yuma was founded. Before Yuma was called Yuma, it was actually called Arizona City. These were also Pueblo structures that were on the site because the city and the mining town was actually segregated. So you had one side with the colonialists, and you had another side where the native population was, and they worked the mine. Sadly, it's safe to assume that the native labor was probably not of choice. So you had involuntary native labor that were kind of housed in one area, while the colonialists were housed in another area, um, and just being used as slave labor, potentially. Along with this is a larger site of the site that I showed you. So those pillars that I'm standing by were the last things remaining of what's probably this structure right here. So you can see the square structures right here, and that's left the wall. It was actually a two-story structure. So it was a significant structure, which is all the more surprising why it just completely vanished. But we finally learned that in this colorized photo um, that what happened was the landowner, because this was always on private land, learned, give or take, in the 1930s that the historical society was probably interested in preserving it. What that would mean is he would lose not rights to the land, but he couldn't further develop the land. And you might wonder, like, what would you develop in that land? And what we have is basically an abandoned mine. He was looking for gold and silver, never found it, but because he was so worried about losing the gold and silver, everything was bulldozed and just destroyed to the ground. We think the only reason the native gravesite was not bulldozed was for two reasons. One is being it was in the vicinity of certain BLM protected land. The second is because it was nowhere near the mines themselves, so he just stopped there just because it wasn't near the land that he wanted to develop. But again, because of these photos and because of our efforts, that photo that I have is the last remaining photo of that previous Pueblo structure right here. And if it wasn't for our efforts in conservation and my heritage, we would not even have photo documentation of that structure. The entire history of it would have been lost. So that's why it's important for natives and indigenous people to become more active in academia, because you never know if the photo you take is gonna be the last bit of data from that site before it's destroyed. And I know it sounds like I'm kind of like, saying the sky is falling, but we have sadly cases that have recently popped up from 2000, 2001, and 2002 where federally protected sites 
and petroglyphs and rock art are still being vandalized to this day. Uh, this is from Bend. Uh, here's my point. This is from Bend. Uh, this is another site south of Bend, and I believe this site is from Georgia. All vandalized, all had initials written on just within the last three years and this year. In fact, the most disturbing piece of vandalism that has occurred is a site known as Birthing Rock, where a racist slur was actually scrawled on with the word white power. That is a, I think the estimate is two to 3,000 year old piece of history now permanently defaced. So the issue of conservation of our history is not greatly exaggerated, if not under-exaggerated. We need to start doing more proactive methods to conserve our history, because it might not even be here anymore. So, my active role as an archeologist. Uh, this is me installing this wonderful piece uh, right here in the Museum of Indigenous People. In fact, after you guys leave the lecture, if you go to the Hopi display case, you can see that piece. You can take a picture with it, you'll know that yours truly installed it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little bit of a treasure hunt for you guys there. Uh, but along with this is further conservation, which brings us to the project that I think everybody's excited about. We meet, uh, I, as an individual and as an indigenous person, am also being, have the privilege of bringing up-to-date methods and surveying techniques to the field of archaeology in the southwest. Basically, what we found was a site, this is known as uh, the more infamous saber cat petroglyph or saber tooth petroglyph. Uh, this is found in here, central Arizona. Again, the sites are not being disclosed because of conservation efforts, because this site, no more than a few feet from this petroglyph, we already found evidence of vandalism, bullet casings, I even found shattered clay pots of people just showing up with a shotgun, throwing targets in the air, shooting the targets right next to rock art. And this is a recognized site. This is a state recognized site. And we still have issues with vandalism. So I, as my heritage, as an indigenous person, and also utilizing years of experience with new techniques in the field of paleontology and archaeology, have been able to do something new called 3D scanning. And 3D scanning is known as, this method here is known as photogrammetry, because 3D scanning traditionally took a huge machine that looked like something out of a sci-fi movie, some out of Star Wars, R2-D2. And you can't drag R2-D2 in the middle of the desert 50 feet up a cliff face to scan a piece of rock art. However, now with new methods, we are able to do the method of photogrammetry where you can take your cell phone, take a bunch of sequential photos, and be able to extrapolate a 3D photo. So our hope is that we can get this technology into enough people's hands and pool resources so we actually start 3D scanning entire formations of 3D art that we label either at risk or even well-known sites that we just need photo record of. Because if you can imagine birthing rock, if it was photo scanned and 3D scanned, we would have a record of it before it was vandalized, which would be crucial to conservation efforts because birthing rock is already asking that that vandalism and that racist uh, sayings are removed. However, if we got a 3D model, we could do it almost overnight. So what we're doing here is, I'm doing here is I'm being proactive. Like, I am actively scanning photos of rock art that are at risk, so God forbid, if they are vandalized in the future, we have a digital record that we can use to undo vandalism and graffiti. Now, with this, we are gonna unveil what is probably the first of its kind in terms of Southwest art. I wanted it to be the first of its kind, but it happened in 2021, and a lot of stuff happened in 2020, which I think distracted us, mainly a plague. Um, but basically, museums are already utilizing 3D scans and making 3D prints of petroglyph art. So with this, we're going to unveil this piece here. Let's find it. So this brings me a lot of pride because this, I believe, is still the first of its kind as sort of Southwest art. What you can see here from these photos is this is a one-to-one -one copy and 3D print of existing Southwest art or the saber-tooth petroglyph. 
Uh, this has been painstakingly printed, assembled. This was a great partnership with my partner back east, Rob Miranda, I gotta give him a shout out, who does a lot of our conservation and 3D print and 3D modeling work. Once the pieces were printed, they were shipped here on location to be assembled by me. I then spent countless hours, and you can ask my family, they, the garage smelled like fumes for days. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and using a lot of visual effects and special effects, mainly in Hollywood, uh, to replicate rock textures and rock art, we were able to do a fairly, almost 95% accurate replication of the saber tooth cliff right there. We even got the gradient, the colors. In fact, I can go to the previous scan, and even the saturations, I, I was second guessing myself because I keep trying to remind myself how red the stone is in Sedona. It's almost unreal, um, but I think I got pretty <laughs> so, this is what a person who's indigenous and native in archaeology is capable of doing, which is why not only are we being proactive in recording our history, we can be proactive in preserving it in more uh, permanent means. Like, this is the first of its kind in Southwest Art. And it brings me a lot of pride and joy to present this to you guys, as you guys are the first to see this ever. So, <laughs> So in closing, I want to go over uh, just all the indigenous people that I've had the privilege and honor to work with uh, throughout the years that I've been doing this. Um, not photographed here is Larry Petrora, uh, who's Quechan, archaeologist in conservation. Uh, this is Jimmy Benegas, he had said Botam, he worked in the field of geology. Uh, Manfred Scott, he is Quechan, he is a conservationist, works in the field of archaeology. Uh, this is my father. He is he at Say Otham, and if not for his research in genealogy, we would not have this right here. Mm -hmm. Additional people in the field are Joe Bernal, uh, who sadly passed away. He was he at Say and was a geologist. Also, Joseph Joaquin Tohone Otham, cultural resource specialist and conservation. Also, a veteran. We thank him for his service. Uh, along with that is who, a person we call Wild Bill, affectionately, Bill Mendoza. Yaki and was a BLM surveyor, which actually helped us locate a lot of these at-risk sites and actively start conserving them. He said Oakdown District Meeting. This is a photo from 2006. Sadly, this district no longer exists. There are efforts to revive this district because the Heot said my people still do not, to this day, do not have land or reservation. Uh, but we were privileged, and I am ever grateful to be a part of those first meetings that we see here. As well as those people, we also want to thank Rene, uh, who uh, is he outside of them and has worked on our exhibits. Also, Benny Valse, who was, I keep saying this wrong, Tara Humara and Kima. And she was our gallery interpreter as far as curator. This is a velociraptor. He is not indigenous to America. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, I do want to thank Isaiah Bernal, who is Yaki and Apache, is a museum volunteer. He's this great man right here, my brother-in-law. <laughs> and Melanie Bernal, her husband, my sister, he said Botam and is the museum employee. She is the Swiss Army Knife of the Museum of Indigenous People. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yes, of course, shout out to all the volunteers, including Amos um, and all the other indigenous volunteers, and also our volunteer family. If you guys want to go ahead and give yourself an applause, you guys have been great. Welcome. <laughs> in closing, I would like to thank the museum itself for being very supportive of our efforts, including Manuel, who has did a great intro. I can't ask a better intro than that. <laughs> as far as Andy, our lead archaeologist here in the museum, he's been great in giving me resources and textbooks about this guy, because very little is written about this guy. And finally, Julie, who convinced me to do this talk in the first place. <laughs> <laughs>